Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to another episode of the Ahmed Khan podcast. Today we are joined again by Brother Ankel, one of the key members of the Three Muslims podcast, which is doing a phenomenal job. Um, and we've had Ankel in the past, and many of you have asked to get him again. So here he is. Thank you for joining us, bro. Well, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, the- it's been a little weird today trying to get it on. That, mm-hmm. that pause that sounded a little weird but um you you get it it's it's been hard trying to get this happening today but alhamdulillah bro, here we are alhamdulillah it, it was meant for it to happen at this time at this place yeah so yeah, this is the qadr of allah um 100 i wanted to ask you since the last time we spoke um have you been reading anything uh have you been any new information that you've been finding out any like well, what's going on in your mind right now with some of the things you're learning yeah, so there are a few books here. I can't bring them up because I actually got my tripod mounted on top of them. <laughs> but uh, it's it's the uh, the ones we were talking about. So the Alchemy of Happiness by mm-hmm. Imam Agazeli, mm-hmm. which, by the way, I don't understand why the uh, introductory part is like a hundred to two hundred pages long. Which who is the author of this translation? Do you know? Is this the big uh, one that I referred to? Yeah, it's um Hujat. Ah, okay, Al, okay. Al Islam Abu Hamid Muhammad Azari Tusi. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how yeah. how is the introduction been? What's the introduction talk about? It's it's just kind of like breaking it down, saying like the different, you know, how it was like in a different language originally, and then like how the different dialects and like what is said and what's it's it's a lot bro but it's it's it keeps going and it it, it goes like that thick before it gets to like the first actual page of the mm-hmm. first chapter well you know so, sometimes um when you have such because that's a canonical book with a mm-hmm. lot of the canonical books they need to be very pres- they, in the intro in the preface they need to explain how they translated it some of the key terms mm-hmm. and stuff but like for the average lay person they can just skip it um it's 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 not really that important you can just start right at the introduction you sure because i I feel like i don't want to miss out on anything yeah like for like they like a lot of these books they'll tell you like this is um and sometimes they'll give like a brief biography about Mm -hmm. imam al-ghazali which is always important but um if you're seeing there's a lot of like technical terms and stuff then you can kind of just move past it but um but it's it's a phenomenal phenomenal book and i think just looking at our world today man there's just there's this crisis of you know what it means to you know to be a human being you know what should we be searching after and we live in this hedonistic culture where people think if i follow my desires i'm going to get happiness but in actuality the more they follow their desires the more their soul begins to get corrupt because that's not what the natural fitra the natural state of a human being is supposed to be doing it should be following the accord the, the plan the laws that god has prescribed for us and through that one can acquire true happiness mm-hmm. and, and you know something interesting which i just learned is that in, uh, in the arabic language if words share the same root that usually means that the word that there's a relationship between the two words and so in arabic the word we have which is uh sa'id uh, or sa'ada means happiness, but from the same root, you also get usarid, meaning to help, to assist. And so our scholars say that one of the ways that you can get happiness is by helping others through voluntary work. And that's why, according to our belief, the happiest person of all was the Prophet wasallam, And nobody served their community more than the Prophet wasallam. He, he served hundreds of thousands of meals to the poor people. He helped the widows. He helped the orphans. He helped the oppressed, the, the slaves of his society. And that's, that's real happiness. And within my own life, I've noticed whenever I've, whenever, whenever I've done this type of work, and I'm sure you can relate, and somebody, you know, gives you a compliment, you know, they send the three Muslims a message saying, you know, like, you guys changed my life. You know, I'm in so much of a better place. There's like a level of happiness you feel when you read something like that, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I've seen a lot of those messages. And mm. so um, I hate to say that I'm I'm kind of like I'm kind of used to them now. I shouldn't be, but uh it, it's always it, you know it's humbling to see that like you had an impact on someone else's life, you know? Mm. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, bro. Alhamdulillah. It just did you want to share maybe like one one of these messages which you found to be maybe profound? Yeah, so um are you talking about from the T3M or are you talking from my channel? Any, anything. Anything where somebody has like really messaged you and they're like, you know, you've really helped me, you know, in my life and I was struggling on a certain topic. Uh, yeah, so when I, and if you can't hear me that well, just let me know. But when I was doing all the videos on NoFap, I had, um, I'm trying to get the camera a little better here. But I, I had a lot of people reaching out to me saying that uh, they, they were addicted. They had all these issues and um, they couldn't go more than like a few hours, let alone like a day. And that following my advice, following like the stuff that I was putting up and they started going three days, five days, a week, two weeks, three weeks, a month. And then some of them like completely let go of the uh, addiction that they had. So it's like when they reach out in that sense, and then they start saying like how grateful they are. It's like, man, Alhamdulillah, bro, that I was, that I was able to play a factor in this person's life when it's like, in reality, I didn't do much except share what I was going through mm -hmm. and like the things that I was learning along the way. And it's like, I'm sure these people aren't even taking everything that I'm saying in, you know, they're probably only receiving what they want to receive or what they're meant to receive, you know, because I could say like a whole bunch of things, but it might only be like two of those words mm. that might stick out to them that might like hit them, you know, mm. so it, it's again, it's humbling to see that uh, I have been able to play a, a, a part in their life. You know, mm. in their story, I've been, I was a part of one of the chapters of their story. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I think that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, you know, in, uh, in, in one of the books, um, I'm not sure which one it is, uh, but Imam Al-Ghazali says that, you know, you want to come, you, you know, you want to be in the world as if that um, when you're leaving, the world knows that, you know, it lost a great person behind like this person came in, he left a real impact on people and on society and he left. Um, not necessarily for the sake of ego, but just like the sense that, you know, you know, I made somebody's life better. Um, yeah. And you yeah, know what yeah. I, you know, what I also find is, um, you know, there's some people that you really help people who are like you mentioned with addictions, uh, with other issues, they're going through very difficult times. They always remember the people who are there for them during those moments um yeah they'll never forget it and i remember when something happened to me um and i got quite sick um you know this one brother messaged to me and he said you know he was almost like crying he was like you know i can't believe this happened to you you know you've done so much for me in that one dark moment when nobody was there for me you were there for me and he said i'm gonna make dua you know consistently for you and i've always been making dua for you for every moment and for me, it's like this realization that how, how much of the success that I've had today is as a result of their du'as for me. Damn. Mashallah. Right? That's true. That's true, yeah. Like, we, we, we have a habit of, you know, we, we always make du'a, but very, and then our du'a gets accepted, but very often do we actually reflect upon, you know, maybe the, you know, the reason it got answered is because of that du'a. Or even the dua, you know, like our friends and our family make for us. Too often we kind of just, you know, we, we kind of think dua is like, you know, just this, it's this nice thing, but, you know, it doesn't really have an effect on people. When somebody tells you, Angel, if you're in a difficult situation, they'll say make dua, right? Like the first thing to come in a lot of people's minds is like, I want something practical. As if dua is not practical, <laughs> right? As if dua can't change destiny, right? And so um, 
I, I found that was, uh, that, you know, especially with your NoFap series, uh, I remember just reading the comments and there was many people who, you know, you could tell just had a lot of this pain in them. Even when I did the pornography podcast, people who have just this pain of, of just really wanting to eradicate their addiction and just trying to find people who can help them because of something they're struggling with. And so I think that series that you did ultimately, bro, was, you know, it was phenomenal. And I'm sure, you know, if 10 people messaged you talking about, and obviously there was more than 10, um, but if 10 people messaged you saying, you know, Ankel, you say, you know, you really helped us out. There was another hundred that helped out, but just didn't message you because only, only a small number of people will actually message. So, um, you know, that, uh, thank you for sharing that, bro. It, it really, because when I hear something like that, it makes me reflect upon my own life, and maybe some of the things that I've done. Um, and it's always important to remember that all of the success that we've ever done is from Allah. Um, and that's why Malcolm X ends his autobiography saying all of the success and good that I've ever done in my life is from Allah. But all of the wrongdoings that I've ever done is attributed to me and not Allah. Subhanallah. Subhanallah, bro. That's facts. Huh. Yeah. But, you know, this is, you know, I think, you know, one thing I'm starting to realize as I'm trying to get involved in like the online Dawah scene, and you guys are like, mashallah, you guys are one of the key, the key figures right now holding it down, um, is, you know, how do you, you know, like, no matter, no matter the nature of the human being and, and, and the self is that it always wants more, right? And, you know, we, we have limits, you know, we want to, you know, we want to get this many views, we want to get this many subscribers, but um, there'll never come a point in time where we'll say we're content with this number. <laughs> we'll always want more. We always want to keep increasing. Do these thoughts go across, uh, across your mind in, you know, whether it's your personal YouTube channel, which has, you know, mashallah, like over 200,000 subscribers or, you know, your three Muslims podcast, which is over 20,000. Is there ever a moment where you're like, you know, we're just content. Like if we never had any more increase in our numbers, we'll be fine. I mean, th there's little moments like mm. that where I might think to myself, like, you know, what, like, alhamdulillah, like, I'm just, I'm grateful for what it is. Mm. But I feel like, I'm going to speak for myself. I'm not going to speak mm -hmm. for uh, Fayyad and, and Rami here. Mm -hmm. But um, for myself, number one, intention is the trickiest thing to get mm -hmm. right. You know, like we always try our best to have our intention be on point. And for the most part, it might be sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes. But um, sometimes it might not be right. Sometimes we might be uh, too consumed in what we're doing Whereas like we, we fail to set our intention or we sell, we, we fail to even see that our intention has shifted mm. and because it's shifted, we start to receive different results because you get what you give. Mm. Right. And, um, with that being said, because intention is like the most, can you hear me properly? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Because intention is like one of the most difficult things to get on luck. Uh, the fact that for myself, I feel like I, I can't stay content with something for too long. Like nothing, nothing satisfies me. Nothing fulfills me. Only Allah, mm. like only Allah. Mm. So it's like, if I'm, even if I have a, the right intention, like I'll lose interest very quickly or I'll lose, uh, I don't know. I just, I lose the, the inspiration, uh, interest, inspiration, probably the same thing. Allah mm -hmm. But, um, I just, it's not the same anymore. Yeah. And then like, because of that, my, 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 uh, intention will suffer because it's an, it's like, imagine you're doing something, you're very passionate about it. Your intention is in the right place. You're like, mm -hmm. oh, I want to help these people. I'm very passionate about this. But like, let's say that passion leaves you what happens to your intention like you still want to help them but like you no longer have that passion so you're just kind of like oh mm. all right well let's let's do this even though you still want to help it's like it's just not the same mm. so like i constantly struggle with that man so mm. you ask me like do i have the 
the thoughts of uh, contentment. Yes, little, little bit, like little pieces here and there, but this is what I struggle with. This is what mm-hmm. I have to like, you know, endure throughout mm-hmm. this whole process. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I fully relate to you, bro. You know, the, you know, it's, you, you know, it's very engaging in the DAO realm online is very different than, you know, one that's in person. And especially with this views count, um, a lot of views, followers, these things can easily corrupt a person's intentions. And sometimes, you know, you'll drop a video or something and, you know, you'll get a massive response from people. You get lots of views and all of a sudden you're mo- motivated. You're like, yo, like, you know, I got to drop another one. I have to do another thing. But then sometimes you also drop one and it doesn't get as many views or as many likes. And then you begin to question why you're even doing this. And, you know, the most beautiful advice I heard on this was a saying from uh, the great mystic Maulana Jalaluddin Arumi, who the West has just claimed as their, uh, as their poet, but he's, a, he's, a, he's an Islamic scholar. But he said, your audience is always an audience of one meaning Allah. And the way I look at this, every time there's a podcast that's dropped, there's only one viewer in reality. And that viewer is either going to like it or he's going to dislike it. And that's the only thing that everything else is just empty. Like there was a, there was a pre-Islamic poet named Labid and, uh, he, he uh, the Prophet sallallahu said in an authentic hadith, um, qawl al-labid, that the truest things I've ever heard, the truest thing a poet has ever said is what Labid said. Kullu ma Anything other than God is vanity, is is empty. And if if I'm if if I'm focusing my 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 content on what other people are uh, would think of it and not how Allah would think about it, then it's all useless. It's all empty. I could have 5 million views on a video, but if there was that one dislike from Allah, there's no point of me even making the video at all. And so this is what I constantly use to, to kind of clean my intentions. is to always remind myself that there's only one viewer at the end of the day. And if that viewer is happy with everything I'm doing, I will continue to do it for the rest of my life. Mashallah. That's, that's pretty powerful, to be honest. I'm going to share that with Fayyad and Rami. Mm-hmm. Go yeah, ahead. Well, that's powerful. I, I never even thought about it like that. Like, I, I knew internally, like, ah, yeah, Allah is always, he's always watching. He always knows what's going on. Mm-hmm. But it's like, that's a different that's a different shift where it's like, yo, the only viewer here is really Allah. Mm. Like, yeah, okay, we got X amount of people from the UK, from the US, from Canada, from Thailand, from India, mm. all these places around the world, mashallah. But in reality, we just have like that one viewer and that's the only one that matters. Mm. And if, if he likes it, hey, alhamdulillah, we're mm. set. But if he doesn't like it, then like, are, are we really doing good? Hmm. Right. Know? Like, for yeah. example, we use, we, sometimes we use clickbait, right? When you're using clickbait, you're trying to attract, you know, the people, but you're kind of changing your product a bit. Maybe you're, you know, you're exaggerating things a little bit. How would Allah think about it? Hmm. Right? How would Allah think about it? Obviously, and, and we'll Allah never know. This. Yeah, yeah, Allah knows yeah, best. Yeah, Allah exactly. knows best. But we can get an idea like, okay, Maybe there's a little bit of deception at play here. Maybe there's an, cause this is what all these, you know, these YouTubers with, you know, millions of subscribers, they have these major clickbait things. It's like, is that, this is what one of my teachers told me. He said, you know, just make your product very clear. No clickbait because at the end of the day, you just, there's only a law there in front of you. And that's why you can't um, change your content to suit people if it displeases a law. Right. Yeah, and then I will go even further to add that uh, if you if you do clickbait, but not in the sense where it's like completely deceiving, where it's like it's still part of the the message, it's still mm-hmm. part of the video, but it's to just get attention. 
that's fine i, I think mm-hmm. that's perfectly fine because mm-hmm. it's again like you have to understand like this whole online thing it's 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 a game and you have to play the game mm-hmm. in order to you know bro we're in the dunya the dunya is <laughs> we got to play the matrix here we got to understand like what we're doing exactly. you know like we can't we understand okay yes the akhira. we understand this is temporary yeah okay but just because you understand this is temporary it doesn't mean that like you're just gonna stop living life mm-hmm. you know you still have to play life you yeah. still have to live life yeah so it's like if you're gonna do the online dawa then you still got to play the game by the rules mm-hmm. and if you play the game appropriately then your online dawa can reach more people you know what i'm mm-hmm. talking about mm-hmm. it's, it's just like military warfare um yep. you know we, we were talking uh we had an earlier podcast on the success of salafuddin and uh what the scholar was saying is um salafuddin at that time you know he, there was no art of war made by the muslims so he had to create his own and so he understood you needed to play the military game but there are rules and we need to have our own Islamic rules for military warfare, which obviously they took from the Prophet wasallam. But even with the online realm, right? We have to play the game, right? We need to know the techniques that are working and we want to attract as many people because this, the online game, you can, like you said, man, you're sitting in the United States, right? I'm, we're both in the United States and we're attracting people from India, from Saudi Arabia. You have Thailand. I have a lot from Malaysia. In, like this is, this is unreal. This is unprecedented. Like we're, we're both in the United States, but we're far from each other. But just because of this one Zoom structure, we can do this call and thousands of people uh, will end up watching it, inshallah. So we have to play the game. You're right. It's an excellent point. We have to play the game. But then same time, we need to figure out, you know, what are some of the rules that we need uh, to make sure we don't go astray? Because many of these Muslims, like, you know, these big vloggers and stuff, you know, there's a lot of click, you know, they're attracting millions of people, but like, they're just, you know, they're deceiving their message. And the one thing about vlogs that I've noticed, bro, is like people who end up doing daily vlogs end up hating themselves, breaking relationship with their like siblings, with their family. Why? Because the camera is following them everywhere. The camera, now the whole world needs to see their life. Um, and then you, at the same time, you have people who are willing to watch, you have millions of people willing to, instead of live their own life, want to watch somebody else's own life. That's what, bro. That's what I'm saying, man. Like, when I first got into YouTube, I had a whole bunch of people tell me, like, yo, yo, you should do vlogging, you should do vlogging. I was like, no, thanks. I do not want to record my life. Like, I feel like when you start doing that, it takes you out of the present. You know, and we already have a hard time as it is being in the present. So imagine now you have this camera and you're always trying to like document every little thing that's happening in your life. Like, bro, it's not going to work, man. Mm. It's not going to work. It, it's going to make your quality of life just drastically reduce. Mm. It's like you, you're about to you're about to share a moment with your friend. You're about to laugh. No, no, no. Hold on. Hold on. Let me bust out my <laughs> camera. Oh, the moment's gone. The moment's gone. You can't get it back now. Allah. And and worst of all, then you have to start, you know, creating artificial moments just so that you can record people. It's like, oh, you know, let's go here because I need to drop a new vlog, a new video. And so people don't realize how dangerous the online realm is to a person's soul and how easily it is for the soul to be corrupted. And, yeah, and pe- bro, people don't realize that the ones who are watching the vlogs, that when you vlog, the people put up a front people put up a character Mm. like people will actually try harder to act a certain way and do certain things than rather just being themselves so it's like people who watch vlogs they're never actually seeing who this real person is who the person really is i should say Mm. and you know everything we're saying extends to social media because you know the majority of people listening to this don't do vlogs but they're on social media. They're still posting, you know, about their lunches or their dinners, um, where they're at. And my question always is like, why do you really need, why do you really feel the need that everybody needs to know what's going on in your life? Mm-hmm. Right. At every moment they need to know, Oh, I was here. I was here. I was here. It's like, just 
just, you know, especially recently, the last month or so of my life, um, I've really been very detached from my phone. And the only thing I'll really be doing is like calling my mom. I, I rarely touch any social media at all. And I feel like I'm just living in a new world now. <laughs> one of my, uh, one of my closest, one of my good friends. Yeah. He's not on social media at all. And you know, he just talks about like, you know, how peaceful it is that like nobody knows what's going on in his life and how much he enjoys it. He doesn't need to say, oh, I graduated. I'm at this school or I just got married. He's just like very comfortable that it's just him and his immediate family and his close friends that know. And I'm slowly now beginning to adopt that approach. I mean, I moved to the United States and with the exception of a couple people, I didn't tell anybody. I literally just like disappeared. Um, and it just feels so nice just having a private life because especially when you're doing like online things like this, you're, you really want to share on Instagram. Oh, I just graduated. Oh, I just got married. Just keep these things hidden, man. People don't need to know what's going on in your life. And I will repeat that. People don't need to know what's going on in your life. You were to see it too. Like no one cares, mm. you know, like, listen, I love my family. I love my sisters. Oh yeah. My sisters. I have a stepsister. So sisters, I love my brothers. Uh, but bro, like if they were to send me like a picture of their food all the time, like, bro, I, I really don't care. Like, don't send me this. Like, I, I'm cool with us talking, like, every once in a while. And I love you. But uh, I don't need to know what you're eating all the time. I don't even know what you're doing. I don't even know, like, what you're doing with your friends. I don't, I don't even know, like, the exact workout that you did. I, don't, I just, I don't need to know it. I don't want to know it. And, like, people don't realize that. And I, I think that's just, again, like, you're too consumed in it to mm -hmm. fully know that like people don't really care you mm -hmm. know and uh for you bro how are you liking it now in terms of like the social media because i know you still got to use social media for like mm -hmm. the, your your podcast and all that stuff mm -hmm. like yeah but look you... yeah go go sorry go ahead no no you could you could go ahead you know the, um like with instagram i'm just posting about the podcast um mm -hmm. like literally i will just go on instagram make the post um, and then just look at my DMS because some people message me, um, and just leave it. But the other thing that's Instagram wasn't that big of a shift, but Twitter was because Twitter is very like, I don't know if toxic is the right word, but there's just so many things going on. Every time you open it, somebody's posting about one of their accomplishments, right? You know, a person in full caps lock. Oh my God, I just graduated. Everybody is liking it, retweeting it. At the same time, they don't realize there's so many people looking at that, wishing that they graduated, and now unintentionally or intentionally, they're giving that person uh, another uh, evil eye. Um, and social media is the window through which the vast majority of uh, evil eye occurs in the world, right? People posting about, you know, oh, this is my wife, and, you know, every day posting about it. It's like, do you know how many people out there are dying to get married? And just are, you know, they're looking at you or your wife with envy now. And now that's causing you to have black magic. And that's why I like these vlog channels. There's always so much tension between the husband and wife for so many things because people are willing. Look, you drop one video, you have a thousand people. Some of these people have millions. All it takes is one person with envy to give you evil eye. That's it. That's true. That's true. Bro. That's it. And so that's one of the things for me personally about social media is I don't post any accomplishment of mine at all. I just keep, if it's something related to the podcast and you know, I need to market it then sure. But in general, just keep it hidden, man. I keep it hidden people. And you know, you have many people today who don't even believe in evil eye. And it's like, what kind of world are you living in? But don't you see what's going on? Don't you see how it's been found in every single culture? But like one of the best advice my teacher gave me is he, he quoted, um, and I think he's a 19th century American um, who said, don't read the times, read the eternities. And what he meant by that is everything that's going on in the media today, whether it's the Taliban, whether it's, you know, a natural disaster, war, these things will always occur in human history. It'll just be a different country. 
there'll be a different situation, but these things will always happen. But he said the eternities, meaning Quran, the word of Allah never change. They'll always be around. And this is where you can derive your real lessons from. And so, you know, I have, I, I, I used to be very attached with everything going on in the political scene, especially with the Taliban early on, I was reading it. And then I just stopped. And I'm like, do I really need to know what's going on? Especially with all the mass deception going on. Do I really need to know what's going on? Or is my time better suited that I could just read the Quran instead or spend more time praying, more time learning about things that I can benefit my life than reading about an update about a person's life. Oh, they just graduated, you know, they married or, you know, conflict on Twitter over stupid matters, right? Or even in the YouTube channel, you know, people always send you comments. Is it really wise to respond to all of these comments? And so don't read the times or read the eternities. Because here's the thing, bro. Reading the times isn't going to get you to paradise, but reading the eternities will. <laughs> Man, and it, if you think about what you said earlier uh the whole social media people basically receiving you know giving nazir like you're receiving it if you're over here saying oh i graduated oh i just i just bought this car oh i just um got married and stuff like that it's like yeah some people might be happy for you but then there's another group of people mm -hmm. that will be envious like you said consciously or unconsciously when someone is envious they are doing the, the nazi the evil eye they have bad intentions like bro it's it's not good for you mm -hmm. as an individual and then you gotta think about it too like you just graduated do you want your reward from allah or do you want your reward from humans mm -hmm. Do you want your praise from Allah or do you want your praise from humans? Mm. Like, do you want humans to say, ah, congratulations? Or do you want the creator to say congratulations and they give you more barakah? We're like, bro, like someone telling you, if I do something and someone's like, oh, thank you. It's like, okay, I don't get anything from that. Someone, if I do something and then someone's like grateful and they're congratulating me or whatever it is, like, bro, like I don't get anything from that. But if I do something, and then like the creator blesses me for that. Mm -hmm. And I stay quiet and just like, just grateful and humble for that. Mm -hmm. like, bro, that's, that's much better than for me to just try to like publicize like what I've done just so that I can get the attention from other people, the praise from other people, the reward mm -hmm. from other people. Mm -hmm. So I think that's something that people fail to mm -hmm. just to think about. And just imagine this, bro, on the day of judgment, None of your followers are going to be like, yo, uncle, we got you, bro. Like that's, that's a every man for themselves type of day, man. <laughs> yeah, man. A long day, but it's every person for themselves. And if you've helped them, then sure, you know, you, you, you can gain benefit from it. But, you know, you knowing, you know, what they ate and, you know, what events they went to and when they graduated is not going to benefit you at all on that day. If anything, it might be a case against you. Because that time that Allah gave you that you should have spent worshiping him or studying or helping your family, instead it was spent watching somebody else live their life, right? And it, 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 for me personally, bro, if I'm, not, uh, if I'm not doing this podcast type of thing, I wouldn't be on social media. I would not, Instagram would not exist, Twitter, I would just be off of it because I, I really don't need it, man. I don't need, you know, and the limited amount of time I'm spending on it is corrupting my soul. Just a little yeah. bit. Yeah. No matter, even though it's just a tiny bit, maybe 30 minutes a day, it's corrupting my soul. Um, and, uh, you know, it's something that we should all seek protection from. Um, and we should really realize because we always talk about, you know, I did a podcast on defeating social media addiction because literally, bro, there are some people who are on social media literally like eight, nine hours a day, especially the whole TikTok phenomenon. Because the way TikTok is, is that they're, they're short videos and they have like a, they have the swipe, the swipe feature. So it's like, you just keep seeing a new video, new video. And not only is it like damaging your soul, but like it's reducing your attention span. So now people only have the ability to watch like a 10, 15 second video. They can't, the reason why podcasts are not gaining, um, although there is a big following, but the reason why many people don't watch it is they don't have the attention span. 
And like, if you, if both of us look at like the, the, the time people spend watching our podcast for many of them, they only get through the first, maybe couple minutes because they just, they just can't handle it. But what's interesting is if I look at the numbers from the podcast app, right? People who actually listen to podcasts, they listen to most of it, the majority of it. And now we're seeing obviously YouTube shorts because people can, again, only handle like 30 seconds. So this is it's a phenomenon, bro. I mean, bro, with what you're saying, like, I feel the same way. You know, like mm. I have, I have two Instagrams. I have one personal, which literally the only time that I go on it is because I follow these uh, certain uh, pages that are, it's about MMA and they have certain breakdowns. So it's like, for me, it's very informative. So I use mm -hmm. it as a tool, but still, even then, like, I'd rather be training versus just watching a video. And mm -hmm. um, when it comes to the actual Instagram that I have for my own YouTube channel, like, bro, I'm barely on that. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to go on it because I know how it is. I know how quickly you can fall into that spiral and just be stuck in it. And I know like, bro, 10 minutes a day, just to mm. post something is enough. It's enough to like pull you away and start like affecting you. And even, bro, even me posting stuff on YouTube, even me posting stuff on YouTube or on my Patreon or for the T3M or stuff like that, like even that, I feel like that's kind of affecting my quality of life to a certain extent. You know, I'm not complaining by any means, mm. alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. But I'm just saying like, I only see what I'm doing now as like one chapter. And I know that there will be a time when this chapter ends mm -hmm. and I will no longer be on the uh, online scene. Mm -hmm. Like you won't, you won't see me. No one will. It'll, it'll be as if I pass away. It'll be as if I'm dead, but I'll still be here, you know, mm -hmm. on Dean, getting mm -hmm. closer to Allah and experiencing life the way that Allah meant for us to experience exactly you know. exactly and this is this phenomenon is only our parents didn't live through this phenomenon they lived in a completely different world you know they didn't have the time to worry about a lot of these problems um you know a lot of the problems we're dealing with today are first world problems <laughs> yeah, yeah. right you know the, the, you know if you go to a third world they don't have the time to think about a lot of these topics. They don't have the time to think. Uh, just yesterday, one of my teachers was telling me, in the third world, they don't have time to think about what gender they are. Um, like that, that, that's a first world problem. <laughs> um, uh, but you know, the one thing I personally found is with, with like, in terms of, you know, this, uh, this Dawa work or stuff, is the work that I do offline with the people I know is so much more meaningful than the work that I do online. Like with a person I have a personal mm -hmm. connection with mm -hmm. that I know and they're going through something and then that I've helped them with, it, it helps me a lot more than just a text message. You know, maybe yeah. I might receive from somebody saying, oh, you know, you've helped me with this. And I'm Which starting is great, like we yes. said in the beginning, but it's nothing like the real life exactly. interaction with someone. Exactly. And that's what this whole social media element lacks is that personal relationship with people. And now I'm starting to focus more on that. So if I'm doing one podcast a week, you know, I'm at the same time, I'm doing way more work in my personal life with the people around me. Um, and obviously those people helping me as well, because, you know, all of us, you know, everybody, you know, needs some sort of uh, quote unquote counselor, somebody to kind of explain their problems to even people like us, because we're all human. We all have our own faults. Um, and so, everybody that's helping somebody is also being helped by somebody else. Right. And so we're stuck in this, you know, we're in this circle where there's not one person who's not being helped by somebody. We're all in this circle together. Well, there is, but he's oh, yes. not a part of this. Subhanallah. Yeah. But that's not a person. That's not a person. Man. And sometimes I think about it and I'm like, you know, that, the ambitious side and, and the hungry side of me is like, no, no, no. Like you can't let this go. Like, why would you let this go? Like with the whole ambitious thing and like the hungry part, like it's a part of me that's like, doesn't want me to let go of this. Cause it sees it as like 
oh, I'm, I'm doing something here. And like my ego gets attached to it. Uh, my ego will get attached to the money. My ego will get attached to the status. My ego will get attached to the uh, praise that I'm receiving. Mm. And even if I strip away my ego, then I'm like thinking to myself, oh, but I'm, I'm, I'm still helping people. Mm. Like I'm still helping people. So I shouldn't stop. But it's like, bro, like this stuff is going to be here online to the end unless youtube just deletes everything or unless youtube is completely deleted itself mm -hmm. our stuff will remain and like whatever we've done now will remain and help people for years and years even after we pass it'll stay it's kind of like we wrote a book but not really mm. you know if we chose like if the chapter is done if allah is like look your time doing this is done now it's time to move on now it's time to get away from the online scene Bro, like, I'm gonna wipe my hands clean here, because mm. I've I've done my part, and what I've done will remain, and people mm. will still benefit from it, you know. Mm. So it's like, and again, like uh, the ego will come and be like, oh, but what if they have questions? What if they need the, your answers? Uh, like, bro, I, I'm not the one with all the answers. <laughs> like the creator is. So it's like if they are looking for the answers, well, they don't need me. Um. They need the creator. So it's like, it's, it's all a process of learning how to step down and then like accepting the flow that Allah has planned mm -hmm. for all of us, mm -hmm. you know? You know, we, we, we always get this um, savior complex mentality. Yeah. Like, I'm going to want that's going to save the people. It's like, you're not here to save anybody except yourself. Like yeah. the reason you're helping others is because by helping others, you're helping yourself. Right. And that's why, you know, that's why, because your, your religion is not complete if you're not helping others. Um, and uh, there's, um, you know, I really want to tell you a beautiful story, which is a story of Imam Al Ghazali's life. I know it's going to, it's, it's, it's such a, you know, I, I cry a lot of times whenever I read it or listen to it. But, you know, you know, he goes up to be this remarkable scholar, brilliant philosopher theologian brilliant lawyer judge um brilliant logician like just as absolutely brilliant man he's known as the greatest scholar of his age he has hundreds of students he's teaching but he realizes that his intention is not clean and so he begins to reevaluate himself and he begins to say look this situation is not working right now. I'm, I'm doing this for, you know, my pride is the reason why I'm doing all of this. I'm giving these beautiful lectures, but I'm not doing it with the right intention. And so he has this, you know, this struggle that he goes through and he says, I need to abandon the world. And I need to just go into, <clears throat> you know, like my cave, like the Prophet used to go into the cave. Like I need to just disappear from the world. That's how I'm going to clear my intention. And he says, one day, you know, when I, I would make up my mind that I'm going to leave, you know, the teaching realm. And for us, this would be the online da'wah realm. And he says, the devil, shaitan, would whisper in my ear saying, come back. Like, you have everything right now. You have all the followers. You have all the views. You have all these people looking up to you. You have position. Why would you want to leave it? And he said, then I would come back. And he said, I was stuck in this debate until he said, one day, I was giving a lecture to the people. And I lost my voice. And everybody was looking around and they're like, what happened to this great scholar? How did he lose his voice? And so he goes to the doctor and the doctor examines his whole body, everything. The doctor says, there's nothing I can do to help you. And Imam Al-Ghazali says, what do you mean? Like, you're a doctor. How can you not help me? Like, I have a problem in my body. And the doctor responded and he said, I'm sorry. The problem is not with your body, but it's with your soul. And there's nothing I can do about it. Inshallah. And then he realizes ultimately at that moment that Allah had made the decision for him that he needed to leave. And so he gives provisions to his family, his wife, his children to make sure they're good. And he abandons his position as the biggest scholar in the world and just travels the world all alone. And he goes, and he really, and that's where he writes his, uh, his revival of the religious science, which the book of death is one of them, the last one. And one of the things he goes to Syria and the people there are, and he's a janitor. Listen to this, bro. 
Is he's it, a Jan. Is it the book of death is that the the remembrance of death yes. in the afterlife. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. So, bro, quick pause. Quick pause. Hold up. Hold up, bro. Now that uh, my tripod is not on the books. Sheesh. <laughs> Sheesh. I see it there. It's the third one. Yes, sir, bro. Oh, nice. So we got the the two volumes. We got the the book that we were just talking about, the Quran, clear Quran, and the other uh, Sufi path of love. Hmm. But keep going, bro. Keep going. And so he he's a janitor now at uh, the mosque in Syria. Hmm. And he's he's think about this is the greatest scholar in the world, and now he's a janitor. So he's a janitor, and he sees that the people there are talking about his book, <laughs> and the people are debating. What did this great scholar mean when he said this statement? And the people were confused. And he had to make a decision. He said, should I go and teach them about the book or not? Because I, I don't want them not knowing. And so he approaches them and he explains to them what it meant. But, and they looked at him and they said, how is, this, how is a janitor going to explain to us what Imam al-Ghazali, the greatest scholar, is saying? <laughs> And so they found out like, oh, he was actually right. And he left because he didn't want them to know who he was because his pride would have came back. Yeah, yeah. And so he continues to travel throughout the world. And then he comes back. And then when the people saw him, they said, you know, it felt like this was a one guy said, you know, you know, he was a very prideful person when I knew him before. So I was very skeptic that when he came back, um, he was acting all nice. But as I got to know him, I realized he changed. And like the old, you know, the, the, the lesson from his life is that, you know, detach yourself when you don't feel the knee is clean. Like when, like, at least that's what I take is that everybody needs that moment where they just separate from reality just for a little bit. Right. And today that would mean social media. If some people think there's a lot of benefit, you know, that they're deriving from social media, just take a break, take a 30 day you know, usually in Ramadan, 30 day break and just see, you know, work on yourself, clean yourself, make yourself stronger, make sure you have the right intention and then come back because he came back then and he continued to publish more books. Um, but his books, you know, the ones that we read of his are, you know, his spiritual ones, because, you know, this is somebody who's gone through that journey, through that test, and he found out what worked. And so, um, but it's such a beautiful story of a man putting his pride down and saying, I'm going to give up everything just for, to clean my intention. That's beautiful, bro. That's beautiful. And that's something that we can all learn from, mm. you know, and subhanAllah, bro, it's, it's exactly, it aligns with what we are talking about. The whole, like, once the chapter is done, it's time to move on. And I feel like this is more so for us and like other people who are on the online Dawa scene. Uh, not, not more so for people who aren't doing it, mm -hmm. but maybe the whole thing of like there's chapters and each chapter comes to an end and a new chapter begins, mm -hmm. right? And everyone has to be like willing to accept that. And if not, then Allah just kind of like makes the chapter end. And then mm. makes you begin the new chapter. And then you have to go through the suffering period, which you could have avoided mm. if you would have just accepted the fact that this chapter is going to end and a new chapter is going to begin. Mm. You know what I mean? Allah. Allah. Yeah. Sometimes Allah creates forces. You don't want to end the chapter, but Allah forces it to end. Yep. And, you know, yep. if your life is a book, the book has a beginning, but it doesn't have an ending. Because the soul always lasts. The soul is eternal. It doesn't die because we're going to be in paradise. So if, if we had a physical book about our life, like our life in total, and our life begins before we're even in this world, right? All of the souls were together in front of Allah. The souls used to intermingle with one another. They used to like certain souls and they used to dislike certain souls. And then ultimately, eventually, the soul is brought down to this world and Imam al-Ghazali in his Alchemy of Happiness, you'll read this. He says, and we use the soul and heart interchangeably because they're, 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 they're one entity, but like different stratas of it. He says the heart comes down to this world as a traveler. 
And the heart's purpose is to just grab its provisions and head back to its ultimate destination. And the analogy he gives of this world is that imagine you're on a ship and the ship is headed to its destination. But while there, it needs to take a detour to grab its provisions. And when you arrive at that island, the, 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 the captain says, everybody get on the island and just grab your provisions and just come back quickly. But when the people get on the island, they see the beautiful women. Oh, see, wow. This is nice over here. <laughs> they see the women. They, you know, for, for women, they see the men. They see all these beautiful animals, all this food, all of it. And they get distracted. And they forget that there's another place they're supposed to go to. But he says the smart people are the one who understand the facade of the island is quickly grab their things, get on the ship and get ready to move to their ultimate destination. And he says that the people who are deluded by the desires, by the time they get back on the ship, they have no provisions to take with them back to their ultimate island. And that the first island is the world of this, is the life of this world. And the last island is the day of judgment. And there, and there Allah will ask you, what provisions did you bring on this day? What did, you, what did you bring on this day that will actually benefit, right? If you help people, you know, and every, here's the thing. If 50% of the world is struggling right now, is going through hardship, and 50% of the world is doing fine, you know what that means? It means if every one person helped another person, all of us would be fine. And that's, and that's why in the Quran, Allah says, if you've saved one life, as if you saved all of humanity all of humanity so um you know just my, my message to everybody including myself including to you is try to have at least one person that you know that's going through a difficult moment that you can try to help because on the day of judgment if you've truly helped them they will pledge for you during that day during that day you know when you're in court and you have like uh you have uh you have people who are giving testimonies They'll give a testimony on behalf of you saying, oh Allah, this person helped me when nobody did. And Allah will accept that from that person. And who, who knows, that might be, that one action might be the reason you get sent to heaven. SubhanAllah. Well, it, what you said reminds me of, um, the quote is actually by Rumi. And it's saying, uh, yesterday I was clever and I wanted to change the world. Today I am wise and I want to change myself. Mm -hmm. I think if I remembered it correctly, give me mm -hmm. one second. Uh, yep. That's exactly it. That's exactly it. SubhanAllah. And you know, that's why that's why Allah says in the Quran, in Allah la yugayiru ma bi qawman hatta yugayiru ma bi anfusihim, that God will not change the conditions of a people until they change themselves. Mm -hmm. It's a Quranic commandment. In, in today's world, especially with social justice, it's all about, you know, let's go change society. Let's go change governments. But usually a lot of time, the governments are a reflection of the people. So you can go out there and, you know, you can try to fix Trump. You can try to fix Biden, but they represent the people, right? There are many Trumps out there. There are many Bidens out there. And so, and you might be a Trump or a Biden, but you won't believe it. <laughs> That's the other thing. Um, and so it always begins with the self. So if you really want to make a change, you need to first fix yourself. Then you need to fix your close family, your friends, your community, and slowly you can move up. But if you haven't done the groundwork on yourself, by the time you get to the top, your knee gets corrupted. You be, And that's why a lot of these politicians, because they haven't worked on themselves, when they get to that level, they eat the people's wealth because they don't know how to control their greed. They don't know how to control their jealousy, their pride. And none of us should, you know, none of us should really be seeking those positions because those positions come with a lot of responsibility and we will be held accountable. Like these politicians, they'll be, they'll probably be held accountable for, you know, the, the people that they were ruling over. And I would not want to be in a position like that. Even with social media, you have, you know, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000 followers, even a hundred and you're doing somewhat of you're doing somewhat of a dawa, you will be held responsible for your people. And that's a very scary thing because I can't even be 
uh, you know, I can't even hold myself to account. How am I going to hold other people to account? It's, 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 it's a double-sided sword, bro, with, uh, with social media and this online realm. Is there's so much change you can make, but at the same time, just as much change you can make to them, so much change and corruption can happen to you as well. That's why we always need reminders like these, reminding ourselves of why we are doing this work, for who we are doing this work, what, what is our determination of success? Is success determined by the views that we have? Or if the things we're saying are in accordance with the law of Allah? Well, so I have a question for you. Since mm -hmm. you mentioned both Imam Al-Ghazali and you mentioned Rumi, and they were both Sufis. Mm -hmm. So what do you think about the whole Sufi thing? Because I, I know, I know like the actual practice of it in terms of like the, the different like rituals that they do. It's, it's a little weird. It's a little weird in my opinion. Mm -hmm. And I know that I, I heard this one dude, he had mentioned a uh, hadith. I don't know how authentic the hadith is, by the way, but it was uh, narrated where and i'm gonna butcher this 100 percent i'm gonna butcher this but it was something about abu Bakr, where he um you know how abu Bakr was just very giving very free with everything like he just he wanted to do everything for allah like mm -hmm. he, he just he, yeah bro he gave away all his wealth all, everything so he gave away all his clothes and he didn't have any he didn't have any pants he didn't have any like anything to wear so he got like the palm trees or the the date trees the the date leaves that were kind of like dead and then he made like a like a skirt or something out of it. And then when uh, when he had come up to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like, "Oh, like what is this?" And he just started laughing. And then he's like, "Oh, I can't remember the rest of the hadith." But again, oh, the the final thing that I want to add about the hadith is that when um when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was laughing and he said what he said. Abu Bakr basically started to spin around, I guess, like enjoy or worship of Allah. And like the, the Sufis supposedly say that that's how the uh, whirling dervish came to be. And like, that's their form of uh, dhikr. And they say that that's, that's one form of dhikr and there's other forms of dhikr. Mm -hmm. But like, again, like, I, I, don't, I don't know how like sold I am on like the different rituals they have, but like the actual the actual like internal aspect of like going inside and mm -hmm. you know like cleansing yourself mm -hmm. purifying yourself to be you know more in tune with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like personally I think that's beautiful but I want to know what you think about it so um everything I'm going to narrate is what scholars have said I'm not going to really give my own opinion unless I say I will mm -hmm. but what's interesting is in that uh that story of Imam al-Ghazali which is found in his um autobiography called Deliverance from Error, um, the Arabic name is called Munqid min al And it's his search for certainty. Like he's really, he's, he's like, I, I'm trying to find that thing that will like calm my soul. So he says, he goes out and he says, he looks into the philosophers. He's like, maybe the philosophers have the key, the secret to happiness. And so he studies with them. He masters their discipline and, he, you know, he critiques them. Um, and he says, this is not what I'm looking for. I'm not looking for philosophy for these thoughts. Not, he's not saying there's no wisdom. He could, obviously, he mastered it, but he's saying that's not what I'm looking for personally. So he put away the side of the philosophers. He said, now I'm going to look at like the legal scholars, the mutakallimun, and he mastered the science. And one thing about Imam al-Ghazali is he, his book on um, the jurisprudence is arguably the most authoritative book in the history of jurisprudence. So he's not just a Sufi. So he knows his legal theory. And everywhere you go, every institution, they have to study it. Because he, he's a juggernaut in that realm. Um, but he says, this is not what I'm searching for either. Like, it's an amazing science, but that's not really what I'm looking for in my soul. He finds a third group, which are called the uh, esoterics, the Baltanias. Um, and they're all about, oh, we don't need scripture. We don't need Islamic law. We're just, you know, spiritual people. Um, today, the closest group to this would probably be the Ismailis, which fall under a specific brand of Shiism. And he said, these guys are missing everything. So
So he finds the last group. They're called the Sufis. Or it's called the Sawwuf. And he says, these guys are focused on the complete inward. They've mastered the inward and the outward. And they've brought them together. That is what I was searching for. And so the lesson being is, um, don't get caught up on terminology, but on the meanings behind it. And so historically, many, many, many of our greatest scholars were Sufis. But at the same time, people like Imam al-Ghazali were the harshest critics of the Sufis that you're talking about today. Um, they were very hard in their condemnation, saying these people know nothing about the religion. They only spend their time doing dhikr or these dances, and they haven't studied the Islamic law. They haven't studied the Quran. They don't really apply. If you go to one of these quote-unquote Sufi masjids, they don't even have prayer times. Did you know that? Many of them, they don't even have prayer times. So the, the, the term Sufi has really been hijacked by this, this new group. But Imam al-Ghazali, who is arguably one of the greatest scholars in Islamic history by everybody identified as a Sufi, um, Fakhruddin al-Razi, who wrote one of the greatest tafsirs, was a Sufi. Like, there are more, like, like the, and the Sufis are really responsible for spreading Islam. Like the whole India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, which comprises maybe seven, eight hundred million Muslims, the Sufis brought Islam there. The Sufis brought Islam to Khabib and the Dagestanis. The Sufis, all of West Africa is really Sufi. Um, but again, this is just a term, right? You look at the meaning behind it. The meaning is this inward spirituality, this dimension of bringing the two together. So when we have the hadith where Jibreel comes to the Prophet ﷺ in the form of a human being and asks about the religion. We have Islam, which is the five pillars. Then we have Iman, which is our six articles of belief, which is the prophets, the angels, um, the books, Allah, uh, the day of judgment, and uh, free will. And then uh, Ihsan is, he said, is to worship Allah as if uh, you as if you see him and uh, uh, yeah, as, as, if, as if you can't see him. Yeah, you know, as if as knowing if, that yeah. he sees you. Exactly, right. Yeah. And so the level of you know, I don't like these terms, but like I just, you know, the, our greatest scholars, even in recent history, were were the Sufis. Um, some of them. I'm not. I'm not giving a preference. I'm not saying what mm -hmm. I am. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying like, you know, like Imam Al Ghazali's books are just so phenomenal, and they've personally transformed my life you know, him, his teachings. Um, and, you know, that's why I'm following. I don't, I'm not with this whole dervish type of business. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not part yeah, of that, but like yeah. authentic, I, like I want to learn this inward spirituality. I also yeah. want to learn Islamic law. How did our scholars create this remarkable set of laws that the West took, Napoleon took, and he used it to create his own law that America used as a foundation for their Louisiana code. And in Canada, we have remnants of it. Like, how did our scholars who, who mastered the inward and they mastered the outward? And too often, bro, we're going to run into people who know everything about the outward, but they can't tell you anything about the inward. And then you have these quote unquote Sufis who know everything about the inward, but nothing about the outward. And so trying to find that balance. And that's why like Imam al-Ghazali's name, you know what his name actually is? His name is Hujjatul Islam, the proof of Islam. And he's recognized. So um, like my personal advice to myself and to anybody else is keep reading his works because his works are basically commentaries on the Hadith and the Quran. So when you're reading his books, you're understanding Quran, you're understanding Hadith, but he writes it in a way in which he, he throws in his personal experience and you're just able to relate with it. No matter what, you know, like if you're trying to get some advice on um, having clear intentions for dawah for online purposes, you read his book on intention, phenomenal book, right? He mentions this one hadith. Um, I can't remember if it's authentic or not, but the meaning is sound where it, sh it shows that the angels present scrolls to Allah of a person's uh, deeds and Allah throws them away and says, and the angel said, why did you throw this away? Oh Allah. And Allah said, it was done. It was done without my intention like it, it was done without you know a pure intention and then at the same time there are other scrolls given to allah 
and Allah um, that are empty and, and Allah adds good deeds to it. And the angel said, oh Allah, they never really did any good deeds. And Allah responds, but they intended to do good deeds. SubhanAllah. Whether or not it's authentic, the meaning is sound is that the niya, the, the intention is what matters. And you're, you're rewarded just for having good intention. <laughs> Right? Even if you, if you have the right intention of doing something and you don't do it, you still get a good deed for it. Right? And so um, life, is, life is already difficult enough, man. We got our own problems that we are going through. We don't have time to get into these debates and arguments, but we do have time to work on our soul. And one of the ways we can really work on our soul is by reading some of these great phenomenal books. Um, and they personally, you know, and then when you go through tragedy in your life, you'll understand it. So in his book on death, Imam Ghazali says, like, the way you should treat death is that when your loved one passes away, the way you should be looking at it as, is, is, is that this is, a, this is a temporary break breakup between you and your loved one because they moved on to the next world and they're waiting for you to arrive there with them. It's, it's, it's very different take from the Western atheistic conception that you're never going to see them again. Who said I'm never going to see them again? <laughs> Who said, right? Just because they've departed from this world, they're, they're, they're ahead of me in the race. And that's why the Hadith says that, you know, when the soul enters into the next realm, all of the other souls are around them. And they say, they say, oh man, how is this person doing? Like what's going on? They want to know what life is like back in the world. <laughs> So it's like, oh, you know, Ahmed, how, how's Ankel doing? You know, how's his podcast doing? <laughs> um, because they understand that it's a temporary breakup. It's not a permanent breakup, right? And we work together. We make sure we get into paradise. And then Allah says in paradise, they're all sitting together. They're on their nice sofas. They have this nice food. They have this wine, which is not alcoholic, which won't make them drunk. And they, and they talk about the previous world. Like, remember, Ankel, when we used to do that podcast with one another? <laughs> And then you're literally in paradise, bro. SubhanAllah. <laughs> MashaAllah, bro. And I, I think, bro, I agree with, with everything you said, by the way, with mm -hmm. the, uh, the not, not the hadith, but the opinions of the scholars that you mentioned and the hadith mentioned as well. And bro, like I'm, I'm of the same way of thinking and the same way of like internal being where it's like, I kind of intuitively understood that like, that's what, the whole Sufi thing was and like when mm -hmm. Imam Agazeli is explaining it I'm like yeah like this is it but then like when I'm seeing these mm -hmm. Sufis like doing these rituals and stuff, I'm like this is this isn't it like this mm -hmm. isn't it chief I can intuitively understand like uh, this is like is this is extra bro like I a lot more and, of them bro and, you a know, lot will judge in the end yeah exactly still, and our bro. teachers our, our scholars always say the real Sufi does not claim to be a Sufi. Yes. Like the one who is claiming he is, is not. Exactly. Exactly. Because it's a, it's an inward journey. Mm. It's like you, you're, you're, like you said, you're fusing the internal and the external, mm. but it's like, you're going inwards here. And if you start saying externally, Oh, I'm a Sufi. Yes, I do this. And it's, it's like, well, well, okay. You just kind of ruined the whole point of it. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know there's, there's too many people out there saying, you know, you know, we have to, you know, do this, do this ruling. This is bid'ah, this, this, you know, oh, you know, this type of dance. It's like, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu said, uh, you know, the religion is, yusr, yusr, religion is easy, right? Just, you know, just understand the basic legal rulings that affect your life, how to pray salah, how to make wudu, how to give zakat, how to go on hajj and umrah, get the basics down, right? And, from then on, just work on that inward journey, man. Because the inward journey is so meaningful. Like, I was, like yesterday, I was I was at school, um, and so I, I moved away from home, and I was just like, I was really just looking up. It was like very cloudy, and I was like, I was like, Allah, where did you bring me? Like, like just 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 because everywhere you go in life is just you know. One of our great Sufi scholars said, Ibn Atallah said. Um, the fool wakes up every day and says, what am I going to do today? But the wise person wakes up every day and says, what is Allah going to do with me today? Because mm. that's ultimately the way you need to look at life. Anytime, 
any tribulation, anything hits you, it's from Allah. And Allah does it with the wisdom. But if you don't see that it comes from Allah, then you'll just complain. You'll say, oh, why is this happening to me? So when I broke my face and I went through the most traumatic moment of my life, I was just telling myself like, like, what is Allah trying to show me through this? Right? And then I told myself, I said, subhanAllah, me sitting here, you know, on like the strongest painkillers in the world, uh, blood coming out of my nose and I'm like, I'm barely allowed to function. I said, if I'm here and I'm patient and grateful, every pain that I'm going through, Allah is removing all of my sins. Everything. So I'm coming out like a pure baby at the end of this with all of the sins gone if I just have the right response. And then I, that, that's, that was the coping mechanism I used to help with the pain. And it significantly helped me during that time. But these are only things I would have learned had I try, embarked upon this spiritual path. And I'm only at the beginning. I'm like literally like, I, I just, I'm still knocking on the door. <laughs> I'm still right there. But it, it'll help you in your own life. And that's really, you can read all these motivational books. They talk about gratitude. They really just take these from our religion. Um, but they do a very simplistic job at it. But that's what it means to embark upon this spiritual path that everybody should embark upon because it makes your life so much better and meaningful and happy. That's true. That's true, bro. And with that being said, man, I think we should uh, end it off there. Definitely. Like, I think I got like four, four or 3% battery. Left. <laughs> no worries. No worries. No. But uh, yeah, bro, always talks with you are always just, they're real. They're unfiltered. And it's at the end of the day, we're two guys who, you know, two guys who are going through it. We don't have the answers. Everything I've said, if there's any benefit, it came from our great scholars and it came from the Quran. Like I'm not in a position to be giving advice. I'm just trying to reiterate what they're saying, right? And try to make it, you know, contextualize it and explain how it helped me. And so, um, inshallah, you know, next time we speak, both of us will be on a higher level on that spiritual ladder and we'll continue to grow and grow on low because we don't want to get stagnant. Because the moment we get stagnant is the moment where we begin to fall. Every empire, the moment they stagnate is the moment they fall. And as long as we keep increasing, we'll never stagnate. And we pray that Allah keeps us sincere in all of our work. We pray that Allah grants us you know, blessings in all the works that we've done, blessings within our own lives. And we pray that Allah grants us paradise. I mean, so take care, guys. Inshallah, we'll see you soon. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ooh,